morning, folks, our first congregation of Solomon. What a day that will be. And I want y'all all to stand. And I want y'all to really think about these words that we're singing this morning. And we're going to do something a little different at the end of the second verse and second chorus. Okay? I want y'all to really, really think about these words as we sing. What a day that will be. Hymn number 762. Then many warned 
command him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let's have prayer together. Father, we thank you for your salvation and your presence and your promise and your power. We thank you for this, your word, that is still speaking to us, Lord, every day. Thank you for your son whom you sent. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came. Thank you for salvation. You paid for our sins on the cross, delivering us and enduring our hell for us and delivering us from that hell so that we can be with you forever and ever. Now, and in eternity. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you for that. We come together in your name. We ask for your blessings. We ask for your power. We ask for you to touch each one of us and speak to us. May your will be done in our lives, in our church, in this community. Lord, day in the world, may your kingdom come. Bless each one who's here. We need your touch. We need your guidance. And we pray that you would accept our worship, that it would be pleasing to you, our Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. While we stand in the number 577, 577 in times like these, and the scripture verse that goes along with this is, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And that's from Hebrews 6, 19.
That is a tremendous song. So I'll go ahead and say it. When you sing that song, do you mean it? Whatever it takes. We're going like Jesus. We're here in a comfortable church house today. There are folks who said that prayer 
and really meant it. And they're out all over the globe today serving the Lord. Maybe in cold territory, maybe in hotter than New Ellington territory, um, and in much more dangerous places. Whatever it takes, I'll do it, Lord. You know, that prayer and that call of discipleship does not end when we get into our 60s or over 65 or 70 or 80 or 90. Whenever it is, right? That call upon our lives is that we say, yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, if you'll use me, I'll gladly say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So may that song challenge all of us as we continue to think about it. Um, so here we are in chapter 10. We read the scriptures together. And um, I want to look at this, a couple of things here. One is I want to look at blind Bartimaeus and see how blind he was. And I want to look at Jesus' compassion and, and con consider that. And then at the end, I want to look at just a few other verses in Scripture that talks about Christians having better eyesight, not being blind. But we'll, that's sort of the survey of the message today. Um, so here in chapter 10, we're looking down at the end, uh, the last account here. And this man mentioned in verse 46 uh, that were, Jesus and his disciples were in Jericho with a crowd. And as they went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, the Bible tells us there was blind Bartimaeus. <coughs> Now, Bar Timaeus, I'm 69 years old, been reading the Bible practically all my life, should have read it more. I always knew the man as Bar Timaeus, Bar Timaeus, Bar Timaeus, that's who he was. But I knew on other accounts that there was a man named Bar Jonah, and that means son of Jonah. You know, or Bar Jesus, there was one named the son of Jesus. I never slowed down on this man's name to realize that Bar Timaeus means he was the son of Timaeus. <laughs> so that's new to me. I mean, I just I never really thought about that, Brother Ron. Um, but that, that was it. So his daddy's name was Timaeus, and he was known as Bar Timaeus, and he was blind. But he was not the only blind man to look for Jesus here or to be around Jesus. And um, the crowd was around him, and yet the crowd couldn't see some things that Bartimaeus did see and that everybody should see. The crowd did not see how Jesus wanted them to see this blind man because, for one thing, this blind man was always there. He, he was always by the gate of Jericho begging for money, begging for alms, begging for food. He'd been there, taken there, maybe got him there. Maybe he knew his way by now. You know, blind people can amaze you at what they can do, yeah. even on their own. So we don't know how he got there, but he was there pretty well every day. And here was the teacher from Nazareth. Here was Jesus who called himself the Messiah, the Son of God. He made some startling claims, but he backed them up with amazing miracles <laughs> and with the power of God himself. Even the disciples were learning about who Jesus was more and more and more. And so here's Bartimaeus begging, and most folks probably didn't even see him anymore. You know, that happens, doesn't it? Something you see and you encounter every day, after a while, you don't even pay attention to it. That's probably the way it was here with Bartimaeus. And the crowds didn't see him. And then when he started hollering out, yelling out for Jesus, the crowd said, be quiet, be quiet. You know, you need to settle down. We're important. We're following an important person. We're going to an important place. We're going to see some big things. <clears throat> but I guess the truth is they were blind, weren't they? They were blind to what Jesus wanted them to see. 
makes me think of the song that David Jeremiah uses a lot beginning his services. Um, the prayer of the song, open my eyes that I may see. Let me see Jesus. Let me see Jesus. And that's a prayer for all of us to see Jesus. If Jesus is who he claimed and claims to be, and you seek for Jesus, he will speak to you. He will open your eyes. And it may be a slow process. It may be an amazing thing process. Right? Yeah. He will reveal himself to you. In fact, he may even reveal yourself to him before you think about asking him to. Probably Bartimaeus did not realize, but when he started yelling out, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David, that Jesus, the son of David, had been looking for him and planning to meet him long before Bartimaeus wanted to meet Jesus. Isn't that good for us? Yeah. That when you came to Jesus, he was already coming to you and dealing with you and pulling you to himself. Not that you were a robot, not that you could, could not resist, but because you had dropped your resistance. Because Jesus is attractive. He draws us to himself. And so there wasn't just one blind man in this story. So as we get into this a little bit further, let's pray together. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us, okay? Pray with me. Dear gracious Father, as we have your word open, um, and right here in front of us, help us to understand. Lord, help us to really see Help us to see like you want us to see what this passage means. And help us to respond, Lord, in a way that would be just life-changing for each one of us and for your glory. We humbly ask you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. So now we have a blind man here, and he hears that Jesus is passing by. And you know, he may have realized that this may be his only chance to meet Jesus. Folks were talking about Jesus. He evidently knew the story of Jesus here. He had heard this. And now he starts hearing the crowd. As he's blind, you can just imagine that you're blind and you're hearing the crowd come around and you keep hearing things. You know, you pay attention when you're blind, I understand. You pay attention to the sounds yeah. way more and voices. And he was hearing those voices. He was hearing the talk. And the talk was how amazing this Jesus was of stories that he had done, miracles he had accomplished. And he might not have realized it, or maybe he did. This could have been his only chance, his first and last chance to meet Jesus. And he determined he was not going to miss it, did he? Wow. He started hollering out and yelling. And you know, I was thinking earlier this week about that idea that it's possible. In fact, I wrote it in my notes. It's possible that somebody could be here today that this is their last chance, and we don't know, to hear the truth about Jesus. This may be, Jesus, you may be saved, you may be a Christian already, a believer, but you may need to say, yes, Lord, whatever it takes, that's what I'll do. He may be dealing with you, like he did Brother John. He spoke to Brother John by teaching that Sunday school class, right, John? That's right. And he just spoke, and Brother John told me, hope you don't mind me relating a little bit of this, but uh, Brother John said, you know, I have never taught Sunday school class, taught the Bible before in my life. But I believe that's what God wants me to do. And he did. Yeah. He didn't say no, no, no. He said, okay, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. And I praise the Lord for that, John. We all have a testimony like that in one way or another, I hope. But this could be the last time that God speaks to you about something, particularly about being saved, about just being sure. You know, you're 98% sure. But what about that 2%? Make sure. Make sure. I don't want to have any doubt for you. And that's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit will tell you that you belong to God, the Father, that you're a child of His. Romans 8, 16. What a glorious verse that is. And so the Bible speaks about receiving the Lord and listening to Him. And that's why the Bible always talks about today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day. So in verse 46, his father's name was Timaeus, and so he's called Bartimaeus. 
but there was more than one blind man. I want to recount for you. You don't have to look at it, but I'll give you the verses. In the last few weeks, when we've covered through the book of Mark, some people that were still somewhat blind. Um, so let's just look back. Remember in chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, Jesus had fed 4,000. And then Jesus looks to the disciples and he says, Do you still not see or understand? He was talking about the bread. Beware of the bread. So they didn't see. In chapter 8, verse 32 and 33, Peter heard Jesus say that he was going to be killed. And Peter rebuked Jesus. And that shows us that Jesus, that Peter was blind to the truth, wasn't he? He was blind to what Messiah would have to go through. Then you get to chapter 9, where Jesus is transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John. And here comes Peter. He doesn't know what to do, so he says, Lord, let's just build us three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, let's just make this a Christian retreat center right here, you know. And uh, But Peter was really blind to what was going on with Jesus at the time. And then also in chapter 9, down to the <laughs> apostle John, John comes up to Jesus and uh, he says, hey, we saw a man casting out demons and uh, in your name. And we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. Well, John was a little bit blind, wasn't he? <laughs> and Jesus had to correct him. <clears throat> Jesus said, no, don't stop. You see, there's more people that are blind. Now in chapter 10 of Mark, remember they were bringing the little children. <clears throat> and the disciples told them, don't bring those little children. It's like Jesus is too busy. And Jesus rebuked the disciples for it. He said, you, <coughs> he said, you shouldn't be doing that. Disciples, um, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for of such is the kingdom of God. <coughs> and then, also in this chapter, in verse 35, after Jesus had talked about being a leader, and Jesus had talked about serving others, and all that in chapter 35. James and John comes to Jesus and says, uh, we'd like to have the two special seats right beside you when you set up your kingdom. And they were somewhat blind to the truth of leadership, weren't they? Amen. Well, so these folks were there. The multitude was there. The crowd was there. And uh, not only were there blind people there, but there were people who did not want to be inconvenienced. Now, when I think about that, I know sometimes I'm blind, but I think more times than not, I consider things to be inconvenient at the time. I don't think I want to do that right now. That's inconvenient, right? Yeah. In serving the Lord and doing the Lord's work or whatever it may be, even Bible reading and prayer time. That's an inconvenient time right now. Well, that's what happened here. Look at verse 47. And when he heard, Bartimaeus, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Even though he's blind, he heard the truth, didn't he? So he already was not totally blind to reality, was he? He was not blind all the way at all. In fact, he could see some things that people with good eyes could not see. But they uh, considered it to be an inconvenience. So in verse 48, they told him, they charged him, that he would be quiet. Be quiet. We're busy. <laughs> uh, and uh, so this crowd and these other disciples, these disciples, they weren't trying to be a servant like Jesus had been telling them about. They were still somewhat blind to being a servant of others. And this was an inconvenience. Here we are. We're doing important things. The Passover is going on. The crowd's getting busy, bigger and bigger. We don't have time to stop and, and listen to you. Um, we're going to the Passover. We're going with Jesus. We've been traveling with Jesus. We are the group. We are the leaders. We understand what's going on. You shut up over here. And we're going to be with Jesus. Because it's inconvenient for you because of this disturbance, part of us. We're moving on. It was a little bit inconvenient. You know, what a shame for the disciples to be part of that. Yeah. Because they were specifically designated to represent Jesus and bring people to him. They had already been rebuked before about not wanting the children to come to Jesus. Here's Bartimaeus shouting. <clears throat> in 
you know, I wonder sometimes if we can set up barriers ourselves and be blind. You know, I'm reminded that Jesus caused the whole world to come to him. And that's what the church should be doing. We should be calling others to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus first. Then you can talk to him about church, right? Yeah. I think I tend to talk to him about church first and then he's in talking about the Lord. You know, but sometimes I wonder, I think I ought to be talking about Jesus first because they may not like us. They may not like me. They may not like our church. They may not look like the uh, outside of our building. They may, may not like you. But if we mention Jesus and invite them to Jesus, Jesus would draw people to himself. Amen. And we should not be barriers in any way. So it was inconvenient. They didn't want to get involved with somebody like that because they were really the blind ones, right? Not Bartimaeus. Um, so Jesus can't, he can't tell exactly where Jesus, Bartimaeus cannot tell exactly where Jesus is so he listens to the crowd and he judges at the right time and he hollers out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, he knew that Jesus was special. He knew that Jesus was the son of David. That means he was the Messiah. He was the one to inherit the kingdom of God. He knew that much. And he knew that he was a merciful God. And he said, oh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he yelled it so much that they said, quieten down. It's a little bit inconvenient. But we need to be sensitive enough to know when people are curious and interested or just willing to hear the truth about Jesus. So we need to be aware of even of our blindness. But Jesus was certainly aware of that. And in verse 49, there's uh, two words right there that show us how different Jesus was than the crowd. And Jesus stood still. We're going, we've been in Jericho, we're going out the gate, the Jericho gate, and we're heading, I don't know where they were heading, but we're going. And the guy on the side has got the big crowd with me. Everybody's all excited. And Jesus stood still. He heard something. And I can imagine those that wanted to get things done, and I tend to be in that crowd, I would have probably said, what are we stopping for? Have you ever said that? What are we stopping for? <laughs> well, come on. But Jesus stopped. He had compassion, didn't he? He had, that, that's just amazing. <clears throat> so why do we stop? And then they hear Jesus say, call him. Tell him to come here. Him? <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, even though it was totally unexpected, uh, they understand that uh, that's why Jesus stopped. So go get him. Go get that blind man. And so they go to him, and they say, hey, cheer up. Get up on your feet. He's calling you. I'm glad Jesus calls us. Oh, to be a messenger that's not lagging behind. Oh, to be a messenger who's not inconvenienced when Jesus says, I need you to do this. Verse 50. So he gets up and he throws off his garment. Wow. He learns that Jesus, this one he followed out to and he's never seen, this man is calling him. Wow. He's the one who reaches out. Jesus is the one who reaches out. So the word comes to him. Hey, he will listen to you. We're going to take you to him. It's Jesus. He's ready to hear what you have to say. Wow. Isn't that just like our Lord? Our Lord Jesus. Wow. So he jumps up and he comes to Jesus. That next verse is verse 51. So Jesus asks him a question. And said, what do you want me to do for you? And um, so here he is. And he said, well, okay. I want to be able to see. Heal my blindness. And so Jesus is questioned to him, what do you want me to do? And his response, I want you to make me whole. Make me be able to see. I want to see. That's a testimony to the faith this man had. That Jesus went to him knowing he had the faith. And he had the faith to ask for Jesus to help him. 
Love of David, have mercy on me. And I think that's what we need to be reminded of ourselves. You know, we still deal with blindness ourselves. Oh, don't you wish you could see clearly right, right now? Don't you wish you could see everything clearly right now? You couldn't handle it. You couldn't either. But don't you wish you could? Wouldn't you like to see all the truths in the Word of God? I would love to see them all. Propaganda. It would just bore me. I'd, just, I'd probably just lay on the floor, wouldn't you? And repent for who knows how long to not be able to move. But I would love to see and know a whole lot more things. We're blind. And we need to acknowledge that. In fact, we need to realize that I'm as spiritually blind as that man in, in Jericho who called you Jesus. I'm so blind that I think I know enough. I'm so blind that I think I'm good enough that I can just rest right now. Folks, that's not what God calls us to do. He's calling us that whatever it takes, that we'll be more like him. He's calling us. And that leads me to my last point here, and that is, how do we see? Are we blind? How do we call on Jesus' compassion and his mercy? Well, look with me, if you will, please, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What a wonderful verse this is, chapter 4 and verse 18. While we, believers, believers, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's the difference in reading this book. If you read this book believing that God is God and Jesus is God, and he sent Jesus, and Jesus came and died for us and rose again and is forever exalted in heaven and he puts his spirit in us and gives us eternal life when we believe in him and repent and come to him and he puts a new heart in us. He changes the life and he makes us into what he intended to make us all along. When we believe, when we read the scripture here and we believe that, then we see the invisible things. We see the invisible things. And without Jesus opening your eyes, without Jesus touching your heart, you nor I would have ever believed this was true. We would have never called upon Jesus and see Jesus and said, Jesus, have mercy on me. So our seeing is a growing process. None of us, I've never met nor heard of anybody, but once they got saved, they then knew it all. Not even after 50 years. You ever heard anybody's been saved for 80 years? Maybe, sure, some folks have. Not, hey, you don't know it all. But God wants you to know more. He wants you to get rid of a little bit more of your blindness. Seeing the truth is what we believe in. That's our believing. That's our growing. And this verse says that we're looking at the unseen truths. Thank God that they are true. They are true. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Also look, uh, if you will, please, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. One other passage right here. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul had a primary concern for the people he wrote to. And that is that they would grow in the Lord. Let's read this prayer, starting in verse 16. Think about seeing with spiritual eyes. Do not cease to give thanks. I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's what I'm praying for you, verse 17. I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. The next verse 18 is that the eyes of your understanding. See that word eyes? So that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And that you may know more than you know already. That you may know more. What is the hope of his calling? 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And then one more verse, continuing on, and that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Paul had a great concern that the people in the church here in Ephesus, that they would grow, that they would not be blind, or their blindness would decrease and diminish more and more. What happens if your blindness goes more and more away? What happens? Your sight becomes greater and greater and stronger and clearer. And may that happen in each one of us. Amen. Until the day we leave this earth. May that happen in each one of us. Is that your heart's desire? I hope so. I hope that you want to know more. There's ways of getting more. Of seeing more. And that is, of course, reading the scriptures and praying. But it's also, and it's also, is reading the scriptures with others. Reading the scriptures with a Sunday school class. Reading the scriptures with other Christians. Reading the scriptures on Sunday night and Wednesday night and maybe another time that you were like inside Bible study or in your home or in somebody else's. Reading the scriptures together. Don't try to grow alone. Grow here at church. I'm glad you're here this morning. I really am glad to see you here. So don't reject growing. We all need to see better. None of us have arrived. We're all somewhat blind. Hey, but thank the Lord saw the light. Amen. Thank the Lord. I'm not blind anymore. Once I was blind, but now I can see. Thank God for that. Amen. I saw the light. I love the light. I love the Lord. I thank you for his touching me, touching you. And as we are considered now to be responding to God's message to us, whatever it may be. I invite you to this altar. I invite you to the front row. I invite you to go to another Christian, another believer right here and ask them to pray with you or you offer to pray with them. This is a time where we respond and say, yes, Lord, whatever it takes. But don't let me go ahead anymore. You know, I'm wearing glasses. I'm dealing with not blindness, praise God. But I sure would like it to be clearer than it is. And that's one thing that um, the Bell's Palsy has done, effective, to prove. But you know, I, I'd like to see more clearly. How about you? I would like to see more clearly. And God can help us do that. Let's bow to the Lord, I want to open my eyes to see and understand more and more. I know, God, I do pray for my brothers and sisters that you would open their eyes to see more and more. And Lord, that when we see more of truth, when we see more of you, when we see more of reality, which would be invisible to the human world, that we would love you more and seek you more and praise you more. God, grant that to be so and never end until you open our eyes wide open when we meet you in heaven. May it be so, Lord. We ask you to help us to be open to others like the Bartimaeus and patient with them who can't see us. Use us as your instruments, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's stand together and respond prayerfully, humbly before the Lord. He leadeth me, mm -hmm. even though we're blind, right?